Time having arrived, I call this meeting to order. Would you all please rise and join with us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're starting tonight's meeting with the hearing of visitors. We have three individuals who have signed in. I'd just like to remind the speakers you have three minutes um, to speak. We do not engage in dialogue. You're willing to make your statement. You're allowed to make your statement. The school committee will take it under advisement. So the first individual that has signed up is uh, James Daly. Welcome back, Mr. Daly. Thank you. you Absolutely. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, continuing the hearing of visitors. It's, uh, it's a great service for the people to come and be able to speak their mind. And since I've left the school committee, I have not uh, left uh, service. I, I keep myself busy. I like to be involved in the community. And one of the things that I'm doing is I currently serve as chairman of the Region 5 Advisory Board for the Commission for the Blind of Massachusetts. I'm also an appointee to the uh, rehab council that also serves the Commission for the Blind. And uh, in October every year, the governor signs a proclamation proclaiming October to be White Cane Safety Month. And today, uh, at the State House, we had an event where today was White Cane Safety Day. Uh, we gathered, a uh, proclamation was read, we had stories from uh, many individuals, the, uh, some legislators, some ordinary citizens. And what White Cane Safety Day is, is an awareness day for the public to uh, understand the, the laws, the rules and regulations, uh, especially around driving when uh, pedestrians are in crossings. Uh, and obviously our focus is on blind people. Uh, some of the problems that we have with people who drive in coming into intersections and stopping and parking, st stopping in crosswalks. Um, that's a violation. It forces people, not just blind people, but blind people have a, a little more difficulty in maneuvering when they're able to line themselves up properly uh, in, the, in, the, in the crosswalks and crossing. And, uh, and, and incurring an obstacle. Um, some of the other things that uh, are, are, can be problematic is people beeping and waving to a blind person to cross the street. Well, <clears throat> we carry a cane because we can't see, and waving to us to cross the street just doesn't help. Um, and there's a proper way for people to cross the street, and people stopping at green lights is actually uh, more of a hazard to allow people to cross, and uh, it, it really is something that uh, should be discouraged. Uh, but this White Cane Safety Day is, is something that happens every day. We have these posters that uh, the school department has uh, agreed to put up in their driver's ed classes, which uh, obviously it's part of the curriculum in the uh, driver's manual, and uh, just an awareness of safety for pedestrians as uh, the month goes on. Thank you. I, I'll leave this here for uh, Jocelyn. I gave her some more, so she has plenty. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the good things about sitting here is I get to talk and leave. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to stay and work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next. Oh, I'll let her get out. Okay. The next um, speaker is Charleston Monfort. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Um, um, one of the main concerns being outlined today um, is the involvement of philanthro capitalists in the destruction of public education. Um, capitalists and corporations are investing heavily in education and altering standards in order to maximize profits. This has been and continues to be an extremely detrimental, uh, continues to be extremely detrimental to education. 
um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, Pearson, and the Eli Broad Foundation are some of the main investors and facilitators of education reform. Um, these foundations and philanthropic capitalists are heavily involved in education and not held accountable uh, and are not held accountable at any point. Um, as a result, high stakes testing is increased on all levels. The standards for tests are designed and regulated by private investors, and a private sector approach is being brought into education. Um, when the implementation of the programs fail, all the investors remove their funding and leave the school districts in disrepair. Um, the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been investing in U.S. programs since 94 and has invested uh, approximately $6 billion since 2006. Um, the experience of the foundation is mainly in technology, and like many other venture capitalists, they have no experience in education. Um, the Gates Foundation and other capitalists supply certain companies with funding who leverage um, the funds to create competition between schools and districts. Uh, the competition comes in the form of uh, additional funding for schools who adhere to the new standards outlined by their private finances, which includes longer school days, school years, professional development agreements, common core state standards, um, newer teacher evaluations, and new teacher responsibilities without pay. Um, the companies given money by philanthropists and um, private foundations focus their attention uh, to states in need of immediate funding. Um, groups such as the Gelfin Fund who donate 20,000 to Brockton Public Schools are outside investors looking to enter the new free market form of education, which we feel is a, is a mistake. Um, there is also the Brockton Community Schools Program, which is soliciting funding from outside sources like the Gelfin Fund to bring private money into public education. This is also something we don't want to bring into public education. Um, these types of programs and foundations help facilitate uh, the private sector approach um, being brought into education. Um, Gates and Pearson has designed a K-12 through language and arts math program to meet Common Core state standards. Um, this is a serious concern because of their previous methods employed by specifically the Gates Foundation and others like them um, have failed to show any actual improvement, have failed or shown no actual improvement in the areas they were implemented. Chartering, vouchers, and turnaround schools have no results supported by evidence that outline a positive change. Um, um, the small schools model um, was a program um, designed and implemented by the Gates Foundation in the early 2000s. Um, this model was designed <clears throat> to close larger schools and break them down into smaller, more efficient schools. The smaller schools became academies that you had to apply to, and of course, all students don't get into. And um, when the school model program failed, the Gates and all the investors, the Gates Foundation and all the investors pulled out um, of the schools in the district suffered. Okay, um, the one thing I want to talk about is the, the students at Emmanuel High in Denver um, were negatively affected by this program immediately. They had 300 bilingual students displaced because of the structure of the program. And Sabbath International is another um, international private company who was worked in Somerville and Foxborough. And once their schools failed, they pulled out of the program. So you can see a lot of people coming to do this same implementation. We would like more voices of the community to be heard in this meeting. We also need to discuss issues at hand with an in depth um, in depth open dialogue analyzing test scores and data in a uh, is not a conversation about education at this point there's a much needed one thank you mrs joyce just as a point of um Reference, uh, Brockton has su successfully blocked Sabbath from uh, opening a charter school in Brockton twice. Next uh, individual signed up is uh, Mr. Rastapina. <coughs> Seconds left. Is this yours? Nope. All right. I'm going to piggyback on mostly what uh, he was talking about also. Um, so what we see with this um, education reform movement is a uh, pro pro proliferation of uh, charitable funds uh, that donate money to schools across the country. And um, these funds are led by uh, Eli Broad, Walton Family Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, what we see is a new style of philanthropy, which has uh, been uh, coined venture philanthropy or philanthropic uh, capitalist. Um, what we're seeing is uh, common objectives of these foundations are to increase standardized testing at all grade levels, um, a standardization of curriculum for the entire nation, and to deunionize the teachers. Uh, they want to do this through uh, methods such as merit pay for teachers tied to student performance and through the use of alternative teacher labor 
laboring forces such as Teach for America. Uh, they also um, uh, are known to disinvest from local public schools in favor of increasing investment in charter schools. Um, the definition of a venture philanthropist, uh, a venture philanthropy, um, differs from regular ph philanthropy because it has a private sector approach to giving um, to influence. So they give money to influence not just educational policies but also the practice of those policies. They advocate for control over teacher prep, which is termed leader prep because uh, they want to turn teachers into leaders rather than uh, teachers. So we see um, the te it's a tech, tech sector style approach being brought to the education system. Um, and this, um, <clears throat> so this, um, what happens also is that this is a very new and unusual thing um, that we're catching up with. Um, <clears throat> They fund schools um, with that with, they also fund programs or other funds with similar minded groups such as the Gelfand um, Charter School Growth Fund and uh, these are astroturf organizations that are designed to create um, a movement for education reform where there is not. Uh, Race to the Top's role in this um, has increased this trend. It allows for local obedience um, to these new policies, creates competition between schools and districts and um, we see this by increasing charter schools and value added measures, increasing um, teaching to the test, um, and a lack of teacher security. Um, these funds mimic the democratic process. They are often, um, their motives and what they're doing is often behind the scenes, um, and they offer a, a top-down approach, which decreases democracy among um, the teaching uh, uh, leadership, and we also see a decrease in teachers' voice voices. Um, this is also we notice a revolving door with the part with um, people leaving, um, say, Teach for America and ending up at the Department of Education, or leaving Teach for America and ending up as the DC uh, head of schools in DC. Uh, we see the Gelfand Fund is a junior partner in this education reform. Uh, one of the things that they want to do is equip students and teachers with knowledge and skills for inquiry-based teaching, and this is done through a Curious Minds initiative. Which uh, the goal is seconds, to, Mr. DePena, just so you know. All right, the goal is to use this inquiry-based model, um, <coughs> which is a standardized model, and um, <coughs> the details of which, which can be contradictory and confusing. Uh, so as we see, um, there's a standardized. They're also trying to standardize the form of teaching and learning um, in schools, which decreases the local control over the curriculum and how teachers are trained and taught and what should be taught. So. Um, that's uh, one of the big problems with these funds is they take away the, the control that the uh, community has. And uh, Brockton's education leadership's lack of a critical eye when analyzing these new state mandated policies leaves Brockton students and teachers in their union vulnerable to the new liberal agenda to privatize education. Thank you, Mr. DePena. Members of the school committee, the next um, item on the agenda is the consent agenda. That's the manner in which the school committee deals with items of routine business. Uh, two school committee members have already told me that they would like items F and G removed. Uh, do other members have any other items that they would like uh, treated, uh, dealt with separately? Mrs. Joyce? H, please. H, and Mr. Donegan? D. D. Anything else? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda excluding items D, F, G, and H. Is there a second? second. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot who had F. Was that Mr. Healy or Mr. Minichell? I requested F, but um, I'm going to yield to my friend Mr. Robinson since it's in his ward and he has so requested. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, item F is uh, acceptance of a walking classroom grant at the Arnon School, uh, something that I'm personally very excited about. Uh, I believe a fifth grade teacher, uh, and, and help me with this if I mess it up, but Laura Letney, mm -hmm. um, wrote a grant last year um, and uh, was informed this year that she received the grant. Uh, what it amounts to is uh, her classroom, her fifth grade classroom, is going to get a $3,000 uh, kit it's going to have iPods in it for every student, uh, as well as a year's worth of podcasts that are aligned with the fifth grade Common Core standards, uh, both for, e or I guess, including ELA, social studies, and science. Uh, she's going to make it a, a commitment to use them at least twice a week uh, for 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, students will get a chance to listen to the podcast, walk around school grounds, um, and 
participate in an interactive quiz at the end. Uh, something I'm, I'm excited about. Um, I've had opportunities to talk to a lot of folks around creative uh, classroom uh, learning opportunities, and I think this is a perfect example of a classroom teacher taking initiative, a principal supporting that initiative, and, uh, and, and helping our students really uh, find some unique ways to learn. Um, I personally look forward to following up with this and, and seeing it in action in the classroom, uh, but I just wanted to thank uh, Laura for, for her work and, and uh, Colleen uh, for her work as well. So thank you both. Well, I, I have one up on you this time, Mr. Robinson, because I had the opportunity last week to go. You already saw And it. I had oh. the iPod on and I walked and nice. it was a, it's a wonderful, wonderful program and Ms. Lutney does a great job with the students and um, the kids really had a good time. Uh, Mr. Mitchell. Since Ms. Lettany and um, Principal Prowler are here, could they just elaborate a little bit in terms of giving us a little specifics Ladies, would you like on? To come down? We had to do it in the gym that morning because it was raining, but it, it was still good, still great. For the rest of us who have not had the wonderful experience that um, the chair has, could you uh, just elaborate and tell us how this will um, actually work and what type of content is going to be uh, used with uh, your students, please? Uh, yes, it's definitely uh, directly aligned with the Common Core Standards, so it's ELA, Science and Math. Um, the Walking Classroom Program is an in-school obesity intervention that promotes health literacy. It develops and supports lifelong fitness habits for all students and it also addresses different learning styles. So we're using the different iPods that have preloaded podcasts on them and uh, they're all directly aligned with the standards so that the students can walk, listen, and learn. And we're about three weeks into the program now. Um, all the fifth grade classes are using them and the children are really excited about it. So it's been great. So it's definitely a, uh, you're getting a positive reaction from their students? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's nice because, you know, these, let's call it a pilot type of a situation mm -hmm. is, um, is, is wonderful. You're basically the testing ground, and if it um, works out for your school and you think it's a good recommendation, then mm -hmm. this is how things grow in a school system. So, um, I brought a couple of quotes to my students write in free write journals each week so a few of them took it upon themselves to just express how much they liked the walking classroom. Uh, one of my students, Odair, said, I love the walking classroom. I love it because you get to exercise. Also, we get smarter. <laughs> and uh, one of my students, Katora, said, the walking classroom is so much fun. I like that the walking classroom gives us a chance to get out of the class and get some fresh air and still be able to learn. I strongly believe that this is one of the worst world's greatest devices for school <laughs> and I really hope that we have the privilege of doing this tomorrow and every day. <laughs> wow. There you go. So they awesome. seem excited. A ringing endorsement. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Mrs. Joyce. Well, just a comment as a mother of two sons that went through the system. I can absolutely see the value in that because my sons had a very difficult time sitting for hours on end and need to get up and walk around and expel some energy and I see the positive and getting Gap, you know, getting that that um, that exercise and, and learning at the same time. So I, I'd love to see something like this expanded. And and kudos to you for thinking outside the box and thinking about different ways that our children can learn. And this is what's great about our teachers in Brockton. I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much for bringing that. Thank you. <laughs> I echo strongly what Mrs. Joyce has said because this is truly not only building teacher leaders but building capacity. I'm sure this is something that you're sharing with your colleagues you're sharing with your families and I thank you for taking that extra effort and having these for our children thank you <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you both of you um, second. motions remain probably second to approve all in favor opposed so moved we'll move on to item mr. Healy with just item G yes we'll move on to item G uh, madam chip and Madam uh, Superintendent, uh, colleagues, I would like to recognize uh, Patty Lopresti. She's here with her husband and family. Uh, she's in management at the uh, Target store in Braintree, and she took it upon herself in a very much unheralded fashion and, uh, and gave, facilitated a uh, generous gift to one of my schools in uh, Ward 6, to Brookfield. Uh, supplies, 
kid supplies, uh, pens, pa pens, pencils, paper, so forth, and s household items that the teachers often would have to buy themselves. Uh, they uh, they were very very happy to get these uh, these items, and uh, I would like to uh, I would like to recognize Patty. Patty, could you uh, could you come up and just say a few things? Uh, uh, let me just. Uh, make this uh, comment beforehand. Uh, I was surprised to hear that uh, Target offers uh, uh, different programs and uh, Patty's going to just elaborate on that uh, briefly. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Patty Lentini. I work for Target in Braintree. Um, Target was nice enough to donate um, a lot of supplies that were left over that well actually we had a lot shipped to us it was an over shippage and um, I got to pick the school and <laughs> since I live in Brockton and since I was a student of the Brookfield school and my That's daughter great. was I chose the Brookfield and I know that every school could really use the supplies I know the teachers could use the supplies um, They'll, there will be more probably coming every time that we um, salvage out some stuff. They have now let me take the overage and, and um, <coughs> donate it to the school system. Nice. So it's a new program that I kind of like helped get going within Target and Braintree. And um, we're just going to keep on donating as much as we can. The other thing is that um, Target does do a lot for education. Um, if anybody has the time to go on to Target.com and just scroll down and into the apps, you'll see that Target will help fund um, field trips. All you have to do is apply. All the teachers have to do is apply to to see if they can get funding for their field trips. They're really good about it. Um, if you have a red card, they have 1% goes to take charge of education to whatever school you sign up to. And it's, I mean, they're just great with education. And I'm just here on behalf of Target to just, just say, you know, thanks for letting us help you out and, you know, we'll help you out as much as we can. Thank you. Anytime. Questions, Mr. Donegan? Just a comment, if you could, um, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of the school committee when I ask you to please extend our sincerest thanks to Target. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to you for, yes. for oh, no. <laughs> to, taking it on yourself to, to help us that way. And You're welcome. It's so important, Patty. Um, you know, thank you again. You know, having been a member, or your daughter went to the Brookfield School. Did you attend also? I went to the Brookfield okay. School well, too. <laughs> well, that's special. Um, but again, looking at the principals that are out here in the audience, you know, it is important when businesses and communities support the schools. These are all our children. These are the, our futures. And you know, from from a backpack to a pen to a pencil to Kleenex right. in a classroom, all mm -hmm. of this is important to make the day a little easier for our children so again on behalf of all of us thank you and we will follow up with uh, checking into the support that our target gives to our schools thank you thank you could uh miss lantini uh, could i just uh, didn't uh, didn't the uh, the kids at the brookfield didn't they they sent on thank yous they sent yes they did they sent a beautiful letter of, of um, thanking target they also each teacher sent a letter that got supplies also. Um, it was just nice because now they're all hanging in the hallway where you walk into where our offices are and, and everybody sees them every day and it just kind of makes everybody smile when they know that these kids are, are, are getting things that they really need and the teachers also. But they did. They everybody wrote beautiful thank yous to the school. I mean, to the um, to Tati. Very nice. School. That's great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Healy. I'd entertain a motion. Motion to accept. Second. Motion's been made. Probably seconded. All in favor? Opposed. So moved. Um,
Who had item D? I'm sorry. Mr. Donegan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, just very briefly, I wanted to. I, it doesn't appear uh, Mr. Genitasio is here tonight. So I. Um, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I did have a question, perhaps for follow up, um, on the item number six in. in, in no, it, well, number four in the package is the is his report, and under Roman numeral one, uh, residency and or guardianship investigations, I perhaps um, doesn't have to be in, in the context of a meeting, but would like uh, some follow up on on that on those numbers, just to see you know who was well, not specifically who, but. You know what was the result of those investigations? Um, we're, we're, what stage they're at at this point? Okay, we will uh, we will talk to uh, Mr. Genitasio and get back to your you're asking again uh, out of the mm -hmm. uh, 93 and 125 investigations. Uh, you're looking for follow-up to see um, what resulted from those investigations. What, if anything, it's, as, you, as you, we all know, it's an ongoing concern of um, people who don't live in the city um, and whose children don't live in the city find ways to um, send their, children's to our, to their children to our schools. So it's obviously something that I want to keep on my radar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I, would you, Mr. Donegan, entertain a motion to at least accept the report? With? I'd make the make a motion to accept the report with um, the subject to the, um, the the other items that that we have been discussed. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Mrs. Joyce, item H. If I could invite uh, Mr. Brock to join us. Uh, he's here this evening. Sorry to put you on the spot like that, but um, we're lucky enough to have you here this evening, so I thought I'd ask about this, um, the Nourishing Kids Initiative. And the only, the only thing I, I really had, I had a question about, was we do have universal um, breakfast in the schools. How do you see this um, expanding on that? And it's three hundred thousand dollars over three years, so it's a good chunk of money for us. So, what ways do you think that that will uh, improve upon what we're already offering? I think it's part part of the grant um, that we that we we've just been awarded is. Um, we're going to be able to implement this in, in all the all the opportunity we can implement in all the schools in the district. So we do have some schools that we don't have the free breakfast. Correct. Universal okay. breakfast is a program that's only available to at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. There's two programs. There's universal breakfast and provision two. Universal breakfast is a program that um, is run by the, the state and. It, and what you get additional revenue by, by the amount of breakfast you serve each, mm -hmm. each day. Provision two is open to all schools, but there's no additional funding. Yeah. Um, and currently right now, um, the, most of this, we have, a, I think, 11 schools that are under Universal, and there's six, I believe, that are under Provision Two. Um, and, and so what, what happens is, is on, on these programs, everybody receives a free breakfast, mm -hmm. um, regardless of their meal status. If paid for, you reduce. Everyone, sure. everyone has the opportunity to receive a free breakfast. Yeah, that's great. And what do you see this doing for us over and above what we're doing now? Uh, Expanding on I think, it? Yes, I think this, this program will be able to expand and we'll mm -hmm. be able, the, the opportunity we'll have is we'll be able to reach um, a, lo a lot more students. Mm -hmm. um, students that right now aren't able to commit, they come into school late or whatever, we'll be able to provide them with the breakfast throughout. Um, we currently now, it's the schools that we're doing, um, we, we reach 92% of the kids. Mm -hmm. um, are having breakfast um, right and now. at one particular school before we implemented the program they were at about 20 percent of the kids reading mm -hmm. so so we definitely we, I think we'll see that um, once these things are implemented that we will be able to um, offer or provide breakfast to most of the students in the district I know one of the things we've heard about is the grab and go yep so they're not sitting down in the cafeteria they're able to bring it to actually bring it to the classroom right 
um, that program is at the Ashfield School. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened, we, we have two options over there. We have a full breakfast where students can come in, grab something to eat in the morning, and sit in the cafeteria. And those that um, come in later or, or choose to go out, they're outside playing or doing whatever, they can come in, grab a bag of uh, <coughs> breakfast, and go into the classroom. And they can eat it um, in the classroom at homeroom or during, um, before school starts. Um, and with that program, we've increased um, about 150 students a day have uh, since we implemented the uh, grab and go program over the Ashfield. Well, what I really like about the breakfast is that even if you're not under a free or reduced lunch meal plan, you know, kids being kids, <coughs> they're running late in the morning, they're trying to catch the bus, and my kids were never interested in eating first thing in the morning, and then all of a sudden they get to school and they're hungry. And you don't want them to wait until to lunch. So I see this as a, a real positive, something to really get the kids going in the morning, especially with their core classes are first thing in the morning. So the more we can expand on this program, I think the, the better our, our kids are going to do academically. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And what happens is, is you know, a lot of students are out and they wait till the last minute to come in. So this way here, the opportunity is they will have their breakfast, and some of them will take um, com a couple of the components and will put it in, and have it later on. Yeah. So it so it works as a works also as a great snack program for them too. So so it. Um, that's that's great. Yeah, yeah, because it's it won't go bad or anything no, like that. No, yeah. no, there's some components here that they actually yeah. can have uh, for later on if they, if they choose to do that. Do you have any idea on when you expect to hear on the rewarding of the grant? Um, or, or have you already submitted we, this? We, we, we've been awarded. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's something that we're already put in place. Okay, that's great. Well, that's great news. Yeah. Yeah. Super. With uh, Mary Ellen Kilrain from the Health and Wellness Department to meet with this group. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are working with Project Bread. They're very much interested in making sure that children have access to free breakfast. Uh, I also went out to the Brookfield School uh, with Principal uh, Val Brower and got a first-hand look. And if you'd like to see this, I'd be happy to accompany you. It, it had been a pilot last year. We're continuing uh, this year with the program at the Brookfield. Our hope is that as the year goes on, we can have planning going on in other schools to join in. Mm. It has been very successful. I actually went to a second grade classroom, a fourth grade classroom. They were doing an activity at their desk. So school had started. Every child went up and got their breakfast. It had been wheeled into the classroom with uh, cold containers. Um, the children continued with their learning. They had their breakfast probably in 10 minutes. It was very quick. They were able to take the carts back down the hallway. The trash bag was put out in the hall. Very clean. And, and I'm told there's fewer referrals to the nurse's office. Mm -hmm. You know, Children are able to learn. There were, were extra food with a sharing uh, for you know a, a fruit or something for later on for a snack. So it has been very successful there. I thank them for implementing it, and we will get back to you on what's happening throughout the district. That's great news. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the, right. the information. Mr. Berkeley, I just want Mr. Robinson in. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I was the school committee member who was actually, because of my participation on the wellness committee, was asked to be the school committee member who put their signature on the grant. And I had the opportunity to sit down when the interviewers, or when the agency came and interviewed us for, for the funding. And a, a lot of folks were there. Uh, Elizabeth Berry was there, to, right? Tom Burke, uh, Mary Ellen Crane, a lot of really great folks. Beyond even the nurse referrals, I would imagine, and I'd love to see numbers eventually, on, I, I would guess that we'll probably have less absenteeism. I would guess that we'll probably have less behavioral referrals to the office over time. Um, you know, and it'll probably even over time contribute to, you know, uh, students' ability to learn in the classroom and rises in test scores. And you know, anecdotally, we can attribute a lot of those things. I mean, what do we tell them right before MCAS? Right, everybody eat a good meal tonight and get a good night's sleep. If it's important that day, it's important every day. And and I think that's what we talked about when the funders came. And I think the funders are behind what's happening here in Brockton. And I, I look forward to seeing it happen in more and more of our schools. So, thank you. Sorry. Second. Mr. Proof. Second. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Mr. Burke, if you just want to stay there for a minute, if, uh, if none of the school committee members have any objections, we're going to take um, item out of order. And um, Chartwells is going to do a presentation this evening, so that's, Mr. Burke is here for that. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Mayor, members of the committee and administration. Uh, my name is Eric Pimentel. I'm the Regional Vice President for Trout Wells in the Northeast, and I'm the fortunate one to be able to work with over 3,000 dedicated uh, food service associates throughout the Northeast on a daily basis, providing nutrition uh, and support and, and reaching out and touching the students in, in that way every day. Uh, third time, I believe, I've been in front of the committee uh, over the last eight years to celebrate uh, something very special. Uh, each year, Trout Wells and Compass Group, our parent company, uh, acknowledges and celebrates uh, one individual that goes above and beyond, uh, as well as uh, I think the accolade years uh, in 2007-2010, uh, Brockton was actually recognized nationally as an account of the year. This evening we're here, and it's funny because it's great segues from Brookfield, but we're here to acknowledge uh, one individual, uh, one of the associates here in Brockton who went above and beyond, and it's related to the last two subjects here. Um, and, and Michelle Sergio, who is in the audience and probably a little embarrassed at this point because she didn't know I was coming this evening, but uh, Michelle uh, is a very dedicated uh, associate who works at the Brookfield School, and Tom Burke is uh, actually going to talk a little bit about that. I'm, I just want to read the, the nomination. One of the parts of this is we had, Michelle was nominated, and I just want to kind of go through the nomination um, and a little bit of background of, of Michelle, how, how this program all started. In January... 2013, Michelle was promoted as a cafeteria manager over at the Brookfield Elementary School. Michelle first had to overcome many challenges with the new staff as well to, to improve the customer service and the perception of the school cafeteria. As Michelle worked to make great strides in improving relationship with school staff, we decided to give her the monumental task of being the first one to implement breakfast in the classroom. Michelle started in January. We, we decided this program we were going to do in February. So quickly she kind of uh, jumped right in um, and gained everyone's uh, confidence from her, her ability to, to take whatever challenges were, were set forth. Um, again, before we implemented the Breakfast in the Classroom program, participation over, breakfast participation over the Brookfield School was 25% of the students were eating breakfast. Um, now, as many as 92% of the students participate in the Breakfast in the Classroom program. Um, it in, in, in also helps, it increases our revenues um, for, from the state federal reimbursements. Um, Michelle's very well liked uh, by many of the schools and uh, teachers and staff. Her positive attitude's infectious. She can be found on a regular basis visiting classrooms to ensure everyone has what they need to make the program successful. In short, 10 years of manager, she has proven to be a true asset to Brockton Public Schools, to Brookfield school staff, students, and to Chatwells. Congratulations. <laughs> Michelle, come on down. Hardware. She wants to do one more. I'm no. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the report of the superintendent of schools. Madam Superintendent, I'll turn Thank you. Thank uh, you. I would like to uh, call Jessica. Uh, Jessica, you have your mic on. Very good. And Jessica is going to give us the report that we spoke about, uh, about Brockton High School. And I will tell you, when she is done, as, as a wonderful student or the great student that she is, tomorrow she has her PSATs. So she will leave us when she finishes her report, Principal Walder. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. There you go. Just kidding. Yeah. Okay. 
So yes, I have my PSATs tomorrow. As a sophomore, um, if you're in Algebra 2 honors, we all have to take our PSATs tomorrow, along with um, all the juniors that attend Brockton High. So tomorrow morning we start, and it takes the first three periods of the day, and then we continue on to fourth and fifth. So that will be sophomores and juniors day tomorrow. Um, so what's been going on in Brockton High is um, last Tuesday in the Red um, Cafe, we had our annual club fair. And what it is, it's a display of um, pretty much most of the clubs at Brockton High, which is about, I want to say, there's at least 20 of them. Um, and um, members of the club set up little displays of what their club contains, I guess, what it's all about. And um, students from Brockton High get to go around um, of all grades and just get to see what Brockton High really has to offer for the students. Um, it's really great for the freshmen, as I can say, last year it really helped a lot getting me involved in all that Broxton High has to offer. So you get to go around and get to see all the different clubs and you get to join and find out when they meet and who um, the advisors are and it's great thing that Brockton High does. So that was last week. Um, as well last Thursday, the peer tutors had their um, training during the day. There was about 40 of them who participated in the training. And what it was, was they pretty much all um, gathered in the Access Center. And um, what they did was they were trained on how to help their peers in certain subjects that um, they are struggling with. And um, peer tutoring is offered during the day as well as after school in the Access Center. And I've personally never been to peer tutoring, but um, I have a couple of um, upperclassmen who are involved that I know find it very, very important to be a part of because it's it's, how do I say it, it's really quite motivating for the students to be able to go in there and know that their peers understand something maybe a little better than them themselves do and they get to go in there and they just get to leave understanding something maybe a little more than they did in class that day. So it's a great thing that students just can feel comfortable going to. So peer tutoring um, is off and running for the year. Um, as well, um, let's see what else. Um, coming up on Thursday is BHS's um, student class elections for the junior class. Um, the sophomore class do, ended up not having any elections because all um, everything was unopposed, is what I was told. I'm not running, so um, so they don't have any elections. So it's just the junior classes, and senior elections will be following up in the next week or so, I believe. Um, and then parent-teacher conferences are on Thursday. And that's what's happening at Brockton High. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Jess. Uh, Mr. Petronio, can you give us the update on the uh, FY14 budget report? As I do around this time of the year, every year, um, we have the process of closing out last fiscal year. Now, although the budget closed on June 30th, that close is for um, all spending across the district. But it takes another three or four months to finish all the accounting work that goes on with closing the budget. In the accounting work, we look at all of our grants, we look at where we can charge back any local funds to grants and basically utilize every dollar of the grants um, so that we don't have to return any of the funds back to the granting sources. And in doing so, we balance out the accounts. We look at what should be charged to a revolving account, what should be charged to a capital, and such. So around this point in the year, we get to where the balance is pretty much um, of the accounts are all used up. And some years we have extra money in ordinary maintenance. Some years we have extra money in personal services. We never have not enough money because then we're in trouble. So, um, in this past year, being able to charge back as we did to the um, different departments, um, we ended up with a balance of a little over a million dollars, which is where we try and come in between one and two million each year. Then what we do with those funds is we use those to pre-purchase for the following year. So when we set our budget every year, we discuss how much we can pre-purchase in chemicals and supplies. Um, so that's where some of those funds went. Um, 
addition to those funds, we also looked at buying laptop carts. We have the park testing coming up, and it's going to be a huge endeavor, but we're looking to begin to start buying laptop, car laptop carts for all of the schools so that as we begin some of the site testing, we'll have um, laptops that, that the students have been practicing and using and be better acclimated to taking the online testing. Um, so with that, um, the first page you have in front of you is the final ESIM for the year. It shows the beginning budget, the year-to-date expended, and then what was unexpended. And you'll see that personal services had a million one left over, and you'll see that the ordinary maintenance is negative 1.1, and that's on purpose because we're trying to balance out the budget. So overall, we spent all funding, and we have about a $28,000, $30,000 left over, which is there's always a chance that there's still something that's going to come through. So you've got to be prepared to have a little extra left in there. So. Um, Basically, you can see all the different spending in the different categories. Some of those categories, like uh, the district tuitions, uh, we try and also when we do pre-purchasing of supplies, we can also, under law, we can pre-purchase or pre-pay for out of district tuitions. We have certain students that we know are in programs that they'll be there again next year, and the state allows us to do that. That's a way of basically carrying some of our funds forward so that we can meet net school spending. In order to um, meet our threshold that's been set by the state every year, we have to spend all of our funding. If we don't spend it, we have to make it up in the following year. So it's to our benefit to try and prepay and get as much as we can in the current fiscal year and move on from there. So with that, as part one of my presentation on the FY13 budget. Um, I'll take any questions, and I'm also looking to um, um, get your permission to move funds from personal services to ordinary maintenance to balance out the accounts. Uh, on a couple of items under the personnel ser personal services, yes. workers' comp and unemployment insurance, we were under budget, especially in the unemployment insurance, and I, I would assume that's because we didn't have any layoffs. Exactly. Um, now, uh, in the workers' comp, we were 77%, so well, we had not well, the workers' comp, the, uh, I've been working with the law office actually the past two years in settling a lot of these workers' comp cases. Okay. They can linger on for, for many, many years, yep. but we've put a program together, myself and, and the lawyer for the city on this item, where we make offers to people who are out on workers' comp to have them settle and basically one lump sum payment and they come off our payroll at right. that point. Right. So that's why those two items are, are as so they are. So how does that change help us going forward when we go to budget for next year? Well, the lower we can get the un well, the lower we can get the unemployment, the better, uh -huh. um, because that's money basically being paid out for no services. Right. The workers' comp we don't have a lot of control over, other than to make sure our work areas are safe, make sure our employees are following proper protocol when handling items and and doing you know different um, services for the for the city. You don't want them falling, tripping. You don't want. You know, if you have a large snowstorm, you don't want them shoveling to the point where they throw their back out. Mm -hmm. Those all become workers' comp cases. Right. Um, our kitchens, everything, as soon as there's an accident or a spill, you know, quick cleanup, make mm -hmm. sure they're wearing the proper shoes, proper clothing. So the, the more we are diligent about watching that, the less chance we'll have in the workers' comp claims. Okay. And um, it was one of the kind of fluky thing here that, um, let's see if I can find it, temporary and seasonal. We had some yes. strange numbers here uh, as far as the percent used. Uh, it looked like there was funds transferred. Yes. Can you explain how you get that 1723.7% used? Sure. Temporary seasonal are a lot of times the funds that we use for college students and high school students that we bring in to work for us. Mm -hmm. So depending on what projects we have going on during the months of, of you know April, May, June, July, um, we'll rather than hire contractors, we'll look at bringing in students if they can do the projects. So in the past year, I know that IT has used, I've approved for them to use um, high school students for doing network work mm -hmm. because our kids are <laughs> really pretty good at this stuff. Yeah. So as far as if we bought 500 new computers, they need to be set up and ready to use, come out of the box, plug in and set up. Our high school kids can do that work wonderfully. Um, Mike Thomas has had projects where he's been uh, you know, putting carpet down, painting and renovating at schools. We've been using high school and college kids for the cleanup, ripping up all the cardboard, yeah. getting into the rubbish. So those are, that's an item that, although we budget a certain amount for temp seasonal, 
it basically saves us money under contract services down below where we would have hired a contractor to come in and do that work. But we didn't utilize those funds very much this year. On temp season? Well, no, we... We only expended... Oh, we increased the budget. We increased... We appropriated 32.7. We transferred out. We transferred out 37.56. If they transferred it out, they probably put it into the part time. Okay. So some money I can see some money went up to the. But we did expend about 33.5. Yes. Okay. Yes. Looks like money been transferred out. It's, that's because of the way the end of the year report works. Yeah. We have to properly classify what we're mm -hmm. paying someone to do. So I guess temp seasonal wouldn't have covered, let's say, the, the students who were doing the networking work that would have gone on to part time. And just one other area I was concerned about is substitutes, because yes. we were 123% um, over budget. When we set the budget, that's one of the areas we always well, look yeah, to cut back. We appropriated 731. Right. But we we, and spent we expended 1.35. Yes. So, what do you attribute that to? Is that, is that a trend that you expect to continue? It's always been around a million, a million one, mm -hmm. and we've been trying to cut back on that line item each year, but that's simply staff calling in sick. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is for uh, professional development when they go out, but primarily it's people taking sick days. Okay. Just to be able to be better prepare for that, I think, would be important as we go forward. Sure. You know. Okay, thank you, Aldo. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Well done. I just had two questions on two light items sure. under ordinary maintenance. The uh, med medical supplies and drugs, we had allocated money in the budget that wasn't used. I know zero was spent out of that. That's probably, that's one of those items I think that we pre-purchased the year before. So that that goes to all the nurses at all the different schools. What so. is that? Is that bandages, first aid kits, stuff yes. like that? Yes. And the other one was uh, purchase of clothing. We had allocated Purch money and it spent nothing. Purchase of clothing is also, um, it says nothing was spent? Yeah. Use nothing. Of okay. I guess we didn't buy any clothes. There is in in the contracts. There's reimbursement for clothing, but I guess that's paid through out of the salary account line item. So the purchase of clothing would have been something that we needed to buy um, for our staff for a special project, and we didn't have any this year. Um, with all the construction projects that went on, I think most of what our staff would have done was done by outside work. Were required, you know, special the you know the white suits that you wear and such. So, yeah, the one in your opinion. Should these be budgeted again this year and paid in advance? Is that Do, Yes, I, I think so because we have the ability to move it to where we need it, if not. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Mr. Petronio on either the um, closing of the FY 2013 or um, the acceptance of the budget report for 2014? Okay, I think we maybe should do two more. Do you have a question, Mr. Haley? Okay. In case we have to do something with another school this summer, whether it's modulars or whatever, where does that, where would that come under? Well, that would come under either any one of the facilities accounts. Okay. Um, there's money budgeted. Um, there's money budgeted for any sort of maintenance work we're going to do. If we're going to be looking at renovating an entire school, then we have to kind of take take a look at the overall budget and decide what is going to happen during the course of this year as far as repairs and, and improvements and what can be put on hold and the money would go towards um, renovating and opening a school. Um, it all depends on, on the condition of what we're looking to work on. If it's going to be more than a couple hundred thousand dollars, then we're going to run pretty tight. We're going to have to shut down certain projects in order to put money aside for something of that magnitude. I see. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to entertain two motions if possible. One, um, the first motion would be to approve the closing of the fiscal year tw 2013 budget. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? 
Opposed? So moved. And then the second motion I'd like to entertain is a motion to accept the FY 2014 budget update report. Can I? Remain probably second. Money from one account oh, to the other. I'm sorry. Yes, I was going to say on FY 13 budget, I'm looking for a, um, a motion to transfer money from personal services to ordinary maintenance to balance. I can make that motion, Madam okay. Mayor. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Motion remain probably seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So I think we need to revise that motion. <laughs> we need to incorporate the amount of money. Um, so, so I would make the motion to transfer $1,175,000 from personal services to ordinary maintenance in order to balance out the accounts for the close of fiscal 2013. Okay. Motion's been made and probably seconded. All in favor? Opposed? So moved. Now, did we do 2014? We did do that, right? Yeah. Accept the report. All right, then we're good. Thank you, Mr. Thank Petronio. You. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ethan Cancel up. Uh, Dr. Cancel has spent many, many hours uh, preparing this report. And, and what I will tell you, um, I, I pushed him to get it done early this year, and, and this is what I would like to see happen. Tonight will be a snapshot of the MCAS results that have come back for 2013. It'll talk about how our district compares with the state, with other like communities, other urban communities. We'll talk about some of our achievements. We'll talk about some of our challenges. The reason I wanted it done early this year is because you've heard me talk about the district review from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that we will now be going into actually as soon as this is completed tonight. Dr. Cancel will also head up that project. This will take us through uh, mid-November when we will actually have a visit with the DESE here in our Brockton community. We're going to be going uh, through a pre-review before we actually start the process very soon. I know we're setting that up. So tonight again is just a snapshot. Uh, when we get into December, January, once our leadership team has had a chance to not only digest the information but also talk to our principals and our school leadership teams to talk about what we're going to do to face the challenges that are ahead for us. Look at other schools that could be superintendent focus or priority schools. So tonight again is a snapshot uh, of the MCAS results so you at least have this information at this point in time. Dr. Cancel. So good evening everybody. I'm uh, greatly appreciative of you all dressing up for this special presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, off, off we go. Only 200 slides, so we'll be under three hours easily. I'm kidding. I do want to frame this so um, what we're looking at tonight we really want to look at accountability for improvement. So everything that we're looking at, it should be seen through the, the lens of how do we use this information to get better? How do we build on our strengths? How do we reduce our weaknesses? This will just lay out the um, order of events. We're going to deal with accountability. That's the state system. That's how we're officially judged by the state. They have a, a system called PPI, which I will go into. I will explain all the names. We'll spend some time looking in greater depth at the achievement levels of our students and then how the state defines growth with the student growth percentiles. And the big question is, how did we do in 2013? We're always going to look at this through a comparison to our past, how the state's been doing, and how we're doing uh, with comparable urbans. So here we go on to the next slide. And uh, here's some key terms. We mentioned this PPI. It's the Progress and Performance Index. And I'm going to spend some time going into it and explaining it in detail. But there, it basically consists of three components, proficiency gap narrowing, student growth percentiles, and bonus points. Everything pretty much starts in their system with CPI. So that's a good place to just review quickly. When you take the MCAS, you get a score between 200 and 280 points. If you score between 240 and 280, you're at the proficient or advanced level. That's where we want all of our students to be ultimately. If you're not quite there, it needs improvement. You can be needs improvement high or low. And they also break out the warning failing category in high and low. And you see on the right side of the screen, there are a certain number of points that are assigned to every student who gets in that category. 
So at the end, you add up all the points, average them, and that is your CPI for English language arts, math, and science. I do want to point out that all of these data that we're going to discuss tonight are only for tested grades. So three through eight and grades 10. All right, so that was CPI. This is the second year of the new accountability system. It went from AYP where 100% of the students had to be proficient to the new goal, which is you cut the proficiency gap in half by the year 2017. I'm going to explain that because it's a little confusing the way the state defines things. You have two schools here represented by a black line and a red line. And you see that the score on the far left in 2011, that's the baseline score of 85 points. What you want to do is you want to take a look at the baseline and say 100 represents proficiency. So what's the gap? What's the difference between that? Well, 100 minus 85 is 15. So your proficiency gap is 15 points. The goal is to decrease that in half. So what you want to do is you divide it by 2. So 15 divided by 2 is 7.5 points. And you have six years to get those 7.5 points. So every year you have to go up 1.3 points. So that's the school represented by the black line. This school started at a 62. You can see that the distance from 62 to 100 is substantially larger. They have a much rockier road to travel. It's going to be much more challenging. 38 points is the, the difference between 100 minus 62. You divide that in two, that's 19 points. So that's going to be their goal, 19 points in six years. It's about 3.2 points a year, and that's very challenging. I should point out that I had no idea about the uh, target um, contribution, but I did have that theme going on, so it uh, just worked out nicely. This is a term that the uh, state uses, that's the, this target, that's why it shows up. This is real live how we're doing. We talked about CPI. E stands for English Language Arts. This is actually how we did. And so we started off in 2011 with a 76.6. We fell a little bit behind down to a 75.5, and we stayed the same. So we have to dig ourselves out of the hole. Get the visual pun there. Um, we have to dig ourselves out of the hole to make that annual uh, 1.9 point gain. We now obviously have to score a lot more than 1.9 just to get back onto target. And you see that with math. You see how this happens. We start at 65.1, then we go to a 65.4, so we improved. Then we went and improved a lot more, but we're still not quite at the target where we need to be, but we are improving. Same story with um, science, every single year we've improved, we're just not improving at the rate. So according to the state system, we are not on target, we're not achieving our goal of proficiency gap narrowing. That's the state's definition. So there you have it. Now, I bring this slide up. This is a state slide that I just took. This is how the schools are classified, and you see this you know, in the packet I handed out, it's on the website. Every school is classified. I, I did it this way to organize it because the law says if you're in the lowest 20% of all schools in the state, you're automatically a level three. You cannot be better than a level three. You could be a level four, level five, depending on the commissioner's decision. But by definition, if you're in the lowest 20%, that's where you are. It doesn't matter how much you've improved year, year to year. If you're in an absolute sense, lowest 20%, that's where you are. If you're above that 20% and you miss the targets, you're level two. If you're above 20% you make the targets, you're level one. And if you're above 20% and you make all the targets and you do a super duper job, you're a commendation school. But the thing that is different and sort of contradictory, but just important to point out, no matter how good of a job you've done for a given year, if you're in absolute terms in the bottom 20%, you can be no higher than a level three. Okay, so some key 
uh, PPI concepts. There's an annual PPI, which you're going to look at the progress from one year to the next, and there's a cumulative. The cumulative is a four-year weighted average, and the big deal about, the only reason I bring this up, you'll see a couple of our schools do not have status. They don't have status because they don't have four years of data. And this is what, when they were reconfigured. So um, that's just there. And then there are points awarded. You get zero points if you declined, 25 points if there's no change, 50 if you improve but you're below the target, 75 if you're on target, and 100 if you're above target. The 75 is basically, when you're at 75, you're doing a nice job in this system. So, how did we do? This is an example of one school in particular. It happens to be the high school, Brockton High School. I wanted to show this to you because this is what the state puts out as a, as a report. And as you can see, it's pretty complicated. They don't bother to highlight like I did and circle things. But you see that there are three big tested areas, English language arts, math, and science. Because it's a high school, and only the high schools, they get dropout rate, cohort graduation rate. It's four years, so 2010, 11, 12, and 13. And you see that you get points for narrowing the proficiency gap, which we talked about. You get points for student growth. If you're above the 50th percentile with student growth, you get the points. And this is interesting. They give you extra credit for decreasing the percentage of students in warning failing, and you get extra credit for increasing the percentage of advanced students. So you add up all the points. Because it's a high school, there's seven indicators. You divide by seven. And at the bottom in yellow, you see that um, this past year, Brockton High had an 86. Remember, I said 75 was good. You do a weighted average of those four with uh, the most recent year counting four times and uh, 2010 only counting one. So you get a weighted average of 88, and clearly we met the target. Now, some of you might have seen that um, Brockton High is not a level one school, which is pretty odd because they met the target. Well, there's a very interesting wrinkle in the law, and I'll explain it very briefly. It's, it's a little bit uh, confusing and it's also a little frustrating. The state decided it wasn't reasonable to have every subgroup counted. So for accountability purposes, they would only count all students and what they call a high need subgroup. High need subgroup is a student who is low income, a student who is with disability, an English language learner. In this way, schools aren't penalized, kids aren't counted three times. You know, because you could be a student who's bilingual, a student with a disability, and a student low income. You'd count three different subgroups. It, you count more than a student who is only in one subgroup. So as you see, when you look down at the annual uh, graduation rate, you see that Brockton made it, no problem, except they didn't make it in the students with disability category, and it just so happens that's the only indicator where they're counting all the subgroups for status. So if the, the law says if you're, um, not the law, the regulation state, if you're below 60%, in any of those subgroups, then you are by definition a level three school. So there are two other schools in the Commonwealth that are in that situation, but it's really a shame because they clearly made every single target. There are quite a few targets to make, and uh, that's status. So just wanted to review this very, very quickly. You can see there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of things that go into this the PPI, and there are a lot of ways to get extra credit, and that part's important because that does give you a chance to improve your score even if you haven't made those targets because, as I pointed out, those targets go up every year, and they're rather challenging. Okay, so what we've all been waiting for, how did we do in terms of PPI? This is the state system. The answer is, wow, we've done a whole lot better compared to 2011. So this is a very positive slide. You see that our cumulative PPI is 53. It's not at 75, but generally speaking, 
compared to other comparable districts, this is a decent PPI. Now we go into a little transition. We're going to spend a little more time going into the CPI in a little more depth because that PPI thing, it's based on uh, the CPI. So here we go. If there was one slide that I could say would summarize how we did, I'd say this is the slide that you want to pay attention to. In English, there's another one for math, there's another one for science. You see that the state's in white, we're in orange, and the yellow is the distance between. So back in 2009, the state was an 86.5, we were to 77.7, so there's an 8.7 point gap. And you can see as time goes on, the state gained uh, three tenths of a point, we went down 2.2. But while that's not a, a good you know, outcome, you do, if you look to 2012, last year, you see that we're flat. So the good news is we're not continuing our slide down. The bad news is A, we're down, and B, the gap has increased. So then we say, okay, so if those are all the grades, is it consistent throughout our system? And it turns out, here's how we do at the elementary three through five level. And it's a similar kind of story the gap has gotten larger with the state. We lost a, a little more than the state. But again, it's a similar kind of good news if you're looking for it. I take heart. I take a look at 2012 and say, you know, that was the year that the slide down sort of stopped because now we're heading back up. So it's not a great gain, but at least it's moving in a positive direction and we're hoping that we can build on that. Because again, it's about where, where are our weaknesses, where are our strengths, how can we improve? So then we take a look at the middle grades and you know, I let the animations do their work. You see a very similar story. The gap's smaller than it was at the elementary level, but you see a, a slide down and you see that the middle grades have lost a little bit more than the state, although the state also went down. So it's obviously an area that we're going to have to focus a little attention on. And then we look at grade 10. This is grade 10, not Brockton High School. It's all of our grade 10. And you see a very small gap. And you see that we had a nice gain. This is the sort of slide you want to see. We've outgained the state. And we, we were both positive, And the gap has gone down. So that's, that's a good slide, good result. Now we look at the exact same thing for math, all grades. This slide tells me, you know, there, there's some good news in this slide. You see that we gained a little bit and the state gained a little more. But what I'm looking at is the gain from 2012 to 13. You see that we had a nice healthy gain there and the state just gained a little bit. So the gap went down. So that tells me something happened. We got, you know, we improved nicely. And so now we're going to look at the different grade levels and see if we can unpack where that improvement took place. Because we want to build on the things that are working and we want to reduce the things that are, you know, our weaknesses. And we see that, unfortunately, the gap has increased here. Over time, the state gained a little bit more, 2.7 points. We only gained um, almost a point. But again, you see a really nice gain from 2012 to 2013. So the elementary grades in math had a very strong showing. And it's very unusual to see the gap narrow that much. You know, so this is a slide that you really, it, it's a good looking slide. It really uh, bodes well. Take a look at the middle grades. And we see we slightly outgain the state. So the gap has gotten you know, from 11.4 to 11.2. And again, we've seen a, a steady climb up from um, our nadir of 2011. So it's a positive slide. And then grade 10, we outgain the state. Gap went down, smaller gap. So 
It actually, this is an interesting slide because we're down slightly from last year in 10th grade. I always thought that last year was sort of a breakout year for them. And this year is just about there. It's more like a consolidation. And that it seems to be a history at the high school because I have the data going all the way back. And they very often follow this pattern. So I would not be surprised at all if next year they jump up again. Then we go through science. And you see that science, um, we're not gaining at the same rate as the state. And we basically have been flat. We did improve a little over last year, though. So again, that's a positive. Look at, we only test in fifth grade, eighth grade, and the high school. So that's why you don't see three through five. You only test in fifth grade at the elementary level. This is a disturbing gap. It's not that we've really, um, you know, the gap has widened dramatically. On the other hand, anytime you see a gap in the 20s, that, that's a little concerning. So this is an area of focus. We see at the middle grades that the gap actually went down. We do see that the scores are low. 57 is still a low score, but um, the gap is heading in the right direction. And in grade 10, we see that uh, we gained, but the state gained more, so the gap is slightly greater. OK. <clears throat> now we shift again, and we go over to the comparable urbans. These are nine of the large urbans that are most similar to us in terms of demographics and, um, you know, as I said, the general size. We're ranked third. You know, if you go out many decimal places, we're slightly ahead of Fall River, but we're basically third when it comes to ranking the CPI for English. Similar story in math, but we're one slot down. We're in fourth place. And then in science, same as math, we're in fourth place. So we're sort of in the middle of the pack. This is how we rank, though, when you start breaking it down. I really like the animation, how that unrolls like a ribbon. Um, the thing that I think people should take a lot of heart in, when you compare how we look compared to these nine districts, where are the top rank in grades 10, 8, and 7 in ELA? We're the top rank in grades 10 and 8 in fourth grade in math, uh, I'm sorry, in math, not fourth grade, in math. And in science, we're ranked number one in first, uh, in 10th grade and 8th grade. So this slide shows a wide variation. We go from being you know, ranked ninth to being ranked first um, at different grade levels. But again, it's really in, you know, I, I used to be in a uh, swimmer, and there was an expression which is, it doesn't matter where you are at the start of the race. And so uh, I think this is a, a very positive uh, outcome. So now we shift over to performance levels where we go into the increase, uh, you want to increase the percent advance, you want to decrease the warning failure. So how did we do? These are all the grades. These are the percentage of students who are scoring advanced. And we see, you know, to be blunt, quite low at all the grades except for grade 10 where a third of the kids or better are advanced. How does it look at math? It's actually a little bit better in math, um, but still low and uh, higher at the uh, 10th grade level. And then at science, I circled uh, eighth grade because there were so few kids scoring advanced that we actually, it rounds to zero percent. But clearly, uh, there are not a lot of students scoring uh, advanced in science. Looking at warning, this is a little bit disconcerting because it's spiking up at the lower grades, especially fourth grade, so we know where our work is. It's um, much lower than it used to be in the middle schools and the uh, 10th grade. Math, we see a slight shift, and we see in the middle grades an area of concern where about a third of the students are in the warning or failing category. So um, that's going to be an area that we need to pay attention to. And science, again, these are only tested in these grades, but um, it's a concern, obviously, at the elementary and the middle school levels. 
Okay, so now we shift to growth and some more definitions. Growth is not, the way the state uses growth, it's not simple improvement. It'd be nice if it was, but they have an academic peer group. Each student is compared to students with a similar score history. They have this very complicated formula how they figure this out. It's all done in percentiles. The state percentile is at 50, so if you're above that, you know, you're doing quite well. And when you just, for interpretation purposes, when you say the 70th percentile, it basically means in this case you're, you're better than 70% or you're scoring higher than 70%. So I'm going to try and uh, show how this is done with this slide with Peter, Paul, and Mary, which um, fewer and fewer of us are getting this reference. <laughs> Peter, Paul, and Mary are, are students, and they're in three academic peer groups because they have different score histories. Back in fourth grade in 2011, Peter scored a 230, went on to score a 236. So all students in the state with that history in fourth grade in 2011 who scored a 230, and in fifth grade in 2012 who scored a 236, those are the students, see them in the purple, that Peter's going to be compared to. Paul is going to be compared to a totally different group who are in 268 and 268. That's their score history, and Mary's in a third group, totally different groups. When you have a million students, which is roughly how many kids take the uh, state test, you can do this. Okay, so then what they do is, they, those are their groups, and in sixth grade and last year, they took the test. What the state does is it rank orders all the students in a group, and it turns out that for Peter, He's in the 40th percentile for his group, and only his group. For Paul, most kids, this is to interpret this, most kids who score 268 and 268 in fifth grade, fourth grade and fifth grade, most of them don't score a 260. That's why he's in the 25th percentile. Most score the same or better. For Mary, it's a totally different story. Most students who score 214 and 215, uh, uh, 214 in fifth grade very few of them jump up to a 226. That's why she's in the 92nd percentile. That's how you can have students with a much lower score have a much um, higher student growth percentile. It's only in comparison to your group. You're only compared to students with your score history. So that's the sort of important concept. The real quick takeaway with student growth is we're solid. These are solid numbers. It's especially impressive at the high school, grade 10. And I don't just mean the high school, at the high school level. 73 student growth percentile is phenomenal. But all of these are very solid. There's, there's absolutely nothing to be alarmed with here. This is a good slide. It shows that we're taking our kids and doing a good job moving them with their uh, history. Math, very similar. It's heartening again to see grade 8, grade 5 have done a very nice job moving the kids forward. So yes, we did see that we had some high warning rates, but we just have to sort of understand that for the students who we have, we're doing a good job moving them along. It's not that they can't do well, but um, we're doing a good job. We can always do better. Okay, the achievement accomplishments. This is the summing it up. Everyone stayed awake. Um, I'm just about to fall asleep, but here we go. ELA grades 4, 5, 6, and 10 improved in CPI. That's a good year. In math, grades 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. So the elementary just ran the table on this. They all improved. Very few grades didn't. That's a phenomenal year for math. Science grade 5 and 8, the CPI improved. In ELA, the, the gap with the state narrowed. You want to see that. That's really, that means you're doing better than most people in the state. You're bucking the trend. So two of our grades did that. And in math, it was, again, just a really great year. Um, grades 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. Science grade 5 and 8 narrowed the gap, which is good. And Brockton High School had the highest CPI for English ever in its history, 95.6. That's no joke. That's a really good uh, score. Achievement challenges, because again, we look at our strengths. We look at the areas we need to do some work. 
grades three through five ELA. Now, Liz Berry and the Office of Teaching and Learning later, not tonight, but later in the year is going to give you a more in-depth presentation. But just to sort of outline, to sketch out, a big strategy that we're going to uh, follow or continue following is we're going to maintain our focus on the very successful pre-K through 12 writing initiative and the reading strategies. So that's where we're going to put our efforts there. Grades 3 through 8, the math warning rates, we weren't pleased with those and so the solution is going to be to continue UBD, which is understanding by design. We saw some very promising results. That's where this, the teachers plan collaboratively. They plan um, whole units, so it's, it's really good professional development and it's very promising uh, preliminary results there. And grades five and eight, even though we understand that those are the tested grades, we're really going to work to expand the Discovery Tech Book training to grades one through three. If we're not pushing it down to those grades and they're not getting a good solid foundation, it's very hard as the students get older to build on that in science. So those are some of the achievement challenges. We have, according to the state, these accountability accomplishments. I had to word this a little carefully. We're the only commissioner's district not to have had level four status because up until this year we could say we're the only one who's never had it. And I guess we could still say that two schools, two districts moved out of level four status. So we're still the only ones who have never had a level four school, which is really a testament considering we've got 17,000 students. We also have 10 schools reaching or exceeding the target set by the state, and you saw how challenging those targets were. So that's really phenomenal, out of 18 uh, possible schools. Some challenges, we're gonna go into this again at a later a presentation, but we had four schools with very, very low percentile scores. And so we're gonna have to put some focus and some uh, efforts there like we've done successfully with two of our schools in the past. Another accountability challenge is just those targets. The reason why I say they rise consistently and why that's a challenge, this is based on 2011. It's theoretically possible that you, you come into a school in 2014 and you're a new principal, you're trying to change things. You're still be, you're being judged on the 2011 baseline. So if your scores went down, you now have a real big hole to climb out of. So that's a very challenging uh, aspect of the accountability system. And then the park impact, which we flat out do not know. We don't know how the, the test is going. We don't know if they're going to adopt it. We don't know what impact it's going to have. We don't know if it's the same as MCAS in terms of the scale, the, the difficulty. So it's just a challenge. It's an unknown. So here we go. This is the slide to uh, ride out on. <clears throat> I'm finally able to do this. We're able to look at students who started with Brockton in third grade and took the test all the way through. These are nothing special about them other than they've been in the Brockton Public Schools from grades three through 10. And so back in 2006, which is the first year that they tested all grades, so that's the reason we can do this, you saw how they did. They scored 78.7 in ELA and 74.3 in math. Went down a little in fourth grade, leveled out in fifth grade, up a little in sixth grade for ELA and math. Then the paths start to converge. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite of converge, diverge. They start to go up in ELA and they start to go down in math. But then look what happens. Those are phenomenal scores. They're better than the state. Those are, these are our students, all of our students, our students with disabilities, our English language learners, our low income kids, you name it. If you stay in Brockton for a long time, you will do quite well in education. So um, this I think is a testament to the fantastic job that the teachers and the principals do. Um, it's really difficult to educate a mobile population you stay in Brockton for a while, uh, that slide says it all. So, we rolled the credits and um, happy to answer any of your questions. Mr. Donegan. So thank you for um, that exceedingly comprehensive and at times entertaining report. Um, I regret 
not having spoken up and, and, and perhaps interrupted you at times and asked the questions while the information was being presented because it is somewhat complicated and I'm, as I look at my notes I realize I didn't do much of a job of, of keeping them but um, the first question that I have is we um, you had indicated it early in the presentation that we're improving but not on target. Uh, it seems that we're improving compared to um, other schools, urban districts, et cetera, and so on. But we don't really have any control over what the criteria that we're improving on are, do we? No, the, the state set, they didn't even tell us. They did it retroactively. The state said 2011 is the benchmark, and that's where you start. And then you have to just in that straight line improve. So um, we never had, you know, if, if your district changes, doesn't matter. You, you get a target, and that's what you have. Okay, and and I, I more throw this out for the committee's consideration. Um, but perhaps you have some insight as well. Is what you know? What can the school committee do to? And, and, and you and I have had conversations on se several occasions. You've indicated what's, what some, you feel some of the, the problems that Brockton has that are unique to, to other schools. What can we do as a committee to uh, impress upon, perhaps on our legislative delegation, uh, some, of the, some of the unique things that we encounter in Brockton and why those can't be uh, uh, considered when when they're determining our scores and our our increase in our um, gap achievement gaps, um, because it seems that, and I th I think I was seeing it in these statistics tonight, but it's once again yes if you stay in Brockton for a long time, you do well. Part of the reason why you do well, and I think in Brockton is many a lot of our population when they first come here they and their families are proficient in English but as they come for a while and by the time they get to high school they are uh, actually much much more quickly than that so that is something that bothers me that that doesn't get taken into consideration in this community because it not only is it a language issue but it's also I think a unique uh, language issue to Brockton because not a lot of communities have a Cape Verdean population and I, it's not as uh, well established a non-English language in, in in the school systems around Spanish and, and, and even French and Haitian Creole are much more established so uh, that's something that I just throw out um, same thing for the student growth percentile you know who determines the formulas and, and what if any input can we try to um, to give and perhaps you can over time give us some guidance on that not necessarily in the context of a meeting but just in, in you know with information um, and then at some point I'd like and I, I suppose the committees uh, excuse me the, the systems planning this but um, what will what is the Brockton schools what will the school Brockton schools plan be um, or what is or what will be it, the plan to target the schools whose um, student growth percentiles were low and, the, and, and you know, what, what we'll be doing to not only, as I said, not only will we certainly be doing a presentation to you about how the district will support our schools, we're going to start this discussion as we start to set up some of our subcommittee meetings. And, you know, I think we're still recovering from 2009. With 17,000 plus students in the right. district, we need to figure out how we now continue to support what's happening in the Brockton Public Schools. You're already looking at class size. We're looking at facilities. We're looking at leadership. Um, you can't, I can't have a school with a thousand students and support them the same way a, a smaller school would be supported. We really have to look at each individual school and find out what that school needs, what's working. We, ha we have this dialogue every week in our executive team meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we you know, start to digest this information, work with our principals, uh, we'll be meeting with them individually, with their leadership teams, and we will have a plan for you going forward. Some of the things we'll be able to do this year, and we'll talk about 
about you know the years going forward as to how we can look at our resources and make sure I love this when we say we want to be resourced for success. Okay, and then lastly, um, a troubling uh, bit of information, of course, is the the ongoing achievement gap uh, between students with uh, certain special needs and uh, what what we commonly perhaps mistakenly refer to as typically developing students. Um, um, obviously, I, I, that would be something that I would love to see is if, if the special education folks could, um, you know, even by way of presentation or by way of some, some information and follow-up, what can we do that we're not doing to close that gap more? That's something I, gosh, I remember talking about when I was campaigning the first time in 2008 I think or something like that so but but I would love to to see some information about that I agree with you Mr. Stone. Okay, thank you thank you I have to say that I'm very happy to hear that I will have uh, more presentations to do but I, I do want to I want to address one item that I think that um, most of what you asked was really appropriately for our superintendent but when you asked about what the school committee can do, I, I do want to give an example of what the school committee already has done. Okay, One of the things that the school committee has done is, under a very tight budget, they invested in one of our lowest performing schools. And the reason I bring this up is, I do have you know some decent relationships with people at the state level, and when they, they talk about Brockton as an example that proactively, before they got level four status, Brockton invested. And we had another school where we had a school committee member who's sitting here, uh, Mr. Carpenter. We went to the state and we said, you know, we're, we're trying for, to win a grant, a competitive grant for a lot of money. And we made a very nice presentation to the uh, state, and that was actually mentioned to me by people who had, you know, said, we were really impressed by how you proactively went after this and how you involved the school committee. So I think that when we talk about things that you all can do, just that active support, it, it, it shows up and people take note. It's not usual, so we have a very, you know, uh, good relationship and hopefully we can build on that because we do have as you point out we have a lot of challenges but we've had some great success and it is thanks to you guys other, other questions uh, Ethan Mr. Healy next time though you need to bring a snare drum <laughs> a couple of rim shots after some of those jokes <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Mrs. Joyce. Thank you for an, another great presentation, Ethan. Next, next time we'll put you earlier in the agenda, though. <laughs> We're getting a little tired at this point at night, during the night. But um, a couple things. Um, I am very concerned with our ELA scores for our youngest uh, students when you have 27% of grade three and grade four. Um, in the only 27 percent in the advanced and proficient that's that's a concern and and i i know that we're, we're taking steps we're looking at our class sizes our class sizes are still too high uh, we have too many of the youngest students and not just grade three because grade three is a result of what happens in grades one and two in kindergarten um, it's not so much what happens in grade three it's what happens before that and our class sizes are just too high um, we have to work more diligently on on our short and long-term plan on what we're opening up more classrooms, getting more teachers in, into the classrooms, and uh, getting these class sizes down, as well as going forward with with uh, moving our start um, our our cutoff date instead of December 31st because our students are that much younger taking the test. So there's there's a couple of components that I really believe are, are holding us back uh, from improving these scores that we have to fix. And um, another one of those is also instituting the pre-K that will allow us to be able to keep those kids and uh, but not throw them into kindergarten and first grade so early in their lives. Um, help give them the benefit 
benefit of more preschool time and more kindergarten time. Be, so they have more educational time before they have to take these tests. So uh, that's really critical and I, and I just can't impress enough upon that because I really do think it will make a difference in our scores. Um, I'm interested in Lynn. Um, I know that they've had difficulties and they've had a lot of challenges and in number one over us. So I'd like to know what's going on there as far as maybe some initiatives that they've put in place yeah. that maybe we could, you know, kind of steal. <laughs> One of the best things you can do is look at best practices. Mm -hmm. And if people are having results, you take a look at that. As you know, uh, I don't know how many times, but people come to Brockton High all the time to take a look at our best practices and, and certainly other schools in the district. So we had talked today, uh, actually we had seen some gains, I believe it was Worcester Middle Schools. And we took a look at that and we were planning to possibly pay a visit to mm -hmm. look at possible best practices. But um, one of the things, uh, as a new superintendent, I've been involved in the urban superintendents. They meet uh, once a month. Uh, it, it's an excellent group, uh, a lot of dialogue, a lot of sharing. Um, and I'm sure we can take a look and, and again, see what those practices might be in the range yeah, for a visit. I think it'd be worth our while. And also, um, another thing that kind of... Um, jumped out at me is, and I've seen it before in previous years, is the jump from the 8th grade MCAS to the 10th grade MCAS. And is it test related? And this is, these kids have been in our system, so they took the 8th grade MCAS, they took all the MCASs before that. So what do you attribute that huge jump? Because that's a, that's a big jump from 68 to 7 to 90. Uh, do you think it's test related? It, it, and I do believe that a certain part of it is being in the system longer, but that is just such a big jump in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, you, you know, you. I mean, they seem to trudge along <laughs> and get better, you know, the longer they're in the system, but then there's this huge spike. Well, there is. You always ask very good questions, and um, <laughs> they're definitely. It's it's a statewide trend, although it's slightly magnified here. Just speculating, I think that some of the reasons are. I know this is hard to believe, especially those of us who have had you know students speaking into the wrong mic. <laughs> The test doesn't actually count for graduation until 10th grade. Mm -hmm. That's an added boost of motivation for students. And maybe in, for some students, they don't need any motivation. They're always trying to get a perfect score. For others, they start waking up yeah. as they get older. Large percentage of our students are English language learners. Their English is getting stronger and mm -hmm. stronger. Yeah, and Tony kind of mentioned on that. It, yeah. it could also be the content of the test. It takes this huge jump up in eighth grade, and then it doesn't get a whole lot harder in tenth grade. That that comment is is familiar, but um, these are these are areas that you know we need to focus on and that we are we have we have groups who work really diligently on this trying to solve solve the problem i think that uh you tend to point to right you know just the right spot we've you must have been listening in on the executive team where we look at lynn we look at lowell who's had great improvements you know john is interested in worcester because they have some incredibly high scoring middle schools and he's thinking what's going on there so Excellent ideas to look at, mm -hmm. at what other districts are doing. And again, they're, we're a district that has grown substantially. We're also out of room to grow. So, you know, I agree with you with class sizes, that, but you need to have a, a, a place to put a new class. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely some challenges on the horizon, but they're good challenges because we're a growing <coughs> district. And I, I keep going back to that slide. You don't get those great scores in 10th grade if the teachers all the way along the line weren't doing a good job. And if they weren't doing a good job, you wouldn't see good growth scores. Because our growth scores are solid, it's telling me that our students are coming in with um, you know, backgrounds that are shaky. And just like you said, yeah. the, the uh, preschool, the uh, what we call the Burr Babies, we did that report, I remember that someone requested that. There are a lot of issues, it's challenging, and um, you know,
Mr. Donegan asked, what can you do? Those are the issues that we're going to need a lot of help on. But um, I'm very confident that the new superintendent put together a good plan and will address them systematically. I do think you've hit on a couple of good points with that jump, Ethan, because it does mean more and the kids are starting to get the importance yeah. of doing well on it. Yeah. And also, by the time they're in 10th grade, they've taken this test yeah. several times, so it's not something new to them. And they start to understand the format of the test, yeah. what's expected, and you know, just like when you take your SATs, mm -hmm. the more you take your SATs, the you know, theoretically, the better you're going to do on them. Um, and just one final question, and I realize it's getting late, but I was interested in this student growth concept, mm -hmm. where you compare a student in a in a um, typical you know, with other typically scoring students mm -hmm. and I'm um, struggling with what the value is both from a teaching perspective and a parent's perspective when you take a look at like you take a look at Mary's score she's mm -hmm. a relatively low scorer mm -hmm. so and then she does marginally better and now she's in the 92nd percentile and one of my concerns about that is is um, is um, putting kids into categories like okay this is as well as you're gonna do and because you have typically scored 214 now you're scoring 226 you're doing well and um, I'm nervous about that and and putting kids into boxes right. that they can never get out of and they, they can never score out of and both from a parent's perspective and a parent's expectations and teachers expectations what so what does the state hope to accomplish by doing this it's an excellent question one of the things we're very cautious about is using the student growth percentile it's sort of shrouded in mystery you don't know where you know how you get in a group but having said that, we try to stress the interpretation is not that there's a limit on what you can do, but if you're a student who scored 260, which is a good score, mm -hmm. and you come home the next year with a 256, which is still a good score, should you be pleased? Well, it depends what similar students with similar scores are doing. It's a way to get a handle on are you, are you doing as you typically do, or are you doing unusually well or unusually poorly? It, it, gives, it gives a parent a sense of, my student's doing better. I will point out with a student like Mary, it is not unusual for a student like Mary to keep on improving at that level. You'll see especially a lot of the English language learners, but not only English language learners, a lot of students who've overcome a disability, so they've sort of gotten how to you know, yeah. accommodate it. You see this steady growth throughout the years, and that's, I think, one of the strengths of Brockton, because you will see these kids who start off at a low score or an average score, and they end up at a very high score. And those are the kids who have high growth throughout. So, so what is the purpose for this student growth percentile? What do you hope to gain from well, well, I can from tell that? you what the state's, uh, I don't know if I would have used it, but mm -hmm. the state came up with it, and the state was hoping to say, to meet the, the concern of the urban superintendents who said, we may not be able to compete with suburban districts because our kids start at a different place. Give us some indication that we're doing a decent job with our students where they're starting from. Because you don't want the excuse, oh, our students aren't start starting at a good point so that we can't expect a lot out of them. Mm -hmm. So this gave a, an opportunity to say, well, you're, you're doing a decent job or you're not doing a decent job. Yeah. So it, it, it affects all the levels. That was the attempt. How successful it is, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I don't want to see happen is, well, this is as good as you're ever going to be. And, you know, low expectations. And, and yeah, just because I, of where you start. Yeah, I don't think it, it will do that. And I, I don't think, you know, Liz Barry would allow that or John Jerome. Or, <laughs> no, I, just I don't can't think they would either. That. <laughs> okay. I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Nutel. Ethan, again, excellent presentation as usual. Um, I enjoy your jokes. <laughs> um, I think at the next... Uh, 
that's a lot of information to digest. Um, I think it's refreshing that we see such good results in the latter years. I think we as a school committee um, have identified and requested in the past to be provided with a presentation and or information with respect to best teaching practices in other communities. We've already asked this question about what Lynn is doing, what Worcester is doing. Um, so what I'm hoping to see they can certainly learn from us in terms of what's going on at the latter years, absolutely. And um, I know that um, Mrs. Barry um, has implemented some changes, and those changes need to take root to give things a chance to take root and grow. But um, what I'd like to see at one of our subcommittee meetings is some comparing and contrasting what do some of these other communities do right but also that we're dealing with apples and apples I'd like to know um, hitting on the issues that were just discussed how old are these kids when they start school you know what is their start date is it you know is the cutoff like we are December 31st are we dealing with an older student body or are we dealing with the kids that are our same age because that I think is a factor when you compare cities and towns when I tell my friends what grades my kids are in they're shocked because it's always they'd be a year younger if they were going to Bridgewater if they were going to Easton or wherever um, so I'd like to know in these urbans, is the start date the same as us? Um, secondly, I'd like to know what the subgroups consist of in those communities to see what percentages, you know, they're dealing with ELL students. I mean, I would uh, think that it's similar with students with special needs. I would think that it's similar, but I'd still be curious to see if we have higher percentages. Um, I'd also like to know, you know, in these in these uh, earlier years, you know, what they're using in terms of models and curriculum, um, what their class size. And this is a lot of homework, but but I, I don't think we should start speculating on this stuff. I think we need to, you know, in order to make informed decisions going forward, how to make change, we, we need to know the answers. Um, what are their class sizes? Do they have smaller class sizes? Again, what are they using for curriculum? What types of uh, um, materials are they using um, in, in the different subject areas? Um, what type of effective interventions have they implemented in their schools you know uh, uh, do they have breakout groups do they you know what is it that they're doing to get the results that they're getting in the younger ages um, and it might be that um, in, with a little more time in another year or two we're going to see that kind of growth and we're going to you know go on another one of Ethan's impressive growth spurts <laughs> um, but you know who knows but I mean we need to open our eyes and see what else is out there and um, you know, this by no means is throwing us under the bus because I think we, we it, it's obvious. We do a lot of things and we do a lot of things right, you know. So, um, but we'd be foolish not to see what else is out there and, um, you know, make change where change needs to be made. That's all. So. Oh, yeah. Mr. Chella, I couldn't agree with you anymore. And, and again, you know, we've got the principals out there on the front line. I wouldn't want to be in any other community but Brockton because I know that they will dig deep. We are starting to look at, we started the other night with our subcommittee meeting on curriculum. We talked about some issues that we had at the high school with scheduling. We're going to start to talk about, you know, staffing organizationally to make sure we're supporting principals. So this is going to continue this dialogue and, and we have a lot of work ahead of us. I feel very confident that we will be able to look at not just the, the so-called homework, but to really see what we need to do to continue to move our district, district forward. It is refreshing. I am out doing these focus groups. Uh, I, I've been at a number of places. Uh, tomorrow night I'll be at, at South Middle School. I invite people to, to come out there. I had a meeting at the Baker School just last Thursday evening, I believe. And this was with a group of Haitian parents, and it was very difficult. You don't realize when people speak another language, there was an interpreter there. Um, but there were probably about 42 parents, very engaged. They want a lot for their children. They like the summer programs for additional support. They like extended learning time. They want to be able to help their children. So not only do I look out there and know the principals are on the front line, the teachers are teaching, your administrators are working hard to make sure we're able to support that and your parents are there and the community support. So we will work very hard to, to, to move forward and to answer your questions. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. One other thing to my wish list is I'd also like to hear from some of the principals who are, who've had some positive results in their schools. Um, 
you know, and how they are doing it. And also seeing how those efforts are being shared throughout the district. We, we've, and we have a lot as a of committee, we've talked to about tell. that too. I mean, we've talked about that. You the know. dialogue we had today in the executive team was looking at a number of the schools and knowing some of the initiatives that are making a difference in those schools, and we will share that with you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Um, I guess I just, and you touched on this a little bit, Ethan, but I worry a little bit that folks at home and f folks that aren't principals in this room leave feeling like the elementary schools are like our weak link or there's something not happening there, uh, that they're kind of an easy fall guy. Um, and and um, I think, you know, you said that the scores that we're seeing in middle school and high school are indicative of the kind of foundation and groundwork that's being laid. I, I, I don't make excuses for anyone, but um, you know, elementary is where we lay the foundation, and oftentimes, uh, you know, kids come in without a place to even put a foundation. <laughs> and and it's not so much that we're not doing things to move those kids along and help them meet ben benchmarks. It's that like we don't even have time to get them there. But over a, f a longer period of time, they they end up filling those gaps, and, and they fill them in the elementary schools, in the middle schools, and in, in the high school. Um, so I, I just. I guess I want folks to know that it's not that there's not good things happening in our elementary schools, and it's not that uh, you know that's where our problem is. It's that you know we just need to figure out how to close those gaps quicker so that we see the results on, on the tests. Um, you know how to address the specific needs and deficits that some of our particular students and, and our particular populations come in with. Um, because I've been in those schools, and I know most well, most of us have, and there's really incredible learning and teaching happening in those schools. Teachers and administrators working really, really hard um, to help students kind of meet their goals, um, and, and parents who are working really hard to support their students. Um, and and it's, it's more a factor of time and, and the gap that needs to be made up in, in a very small space of time versus the gap that's made up over the course of a long period of time um, that, that sometimes is reflected in these scores. And I just, I really worry that folks say, well, we have great high school, but we don't, you know, we have problems at our elementary school. And, and, and I, I know that that's not the case. Um, and, and so, I, not to say that that's what you intended to communicate, but I worry that that's what some people hear when they see these numbers. Um, and they kind of break them down in some very simple ways. I think you make a great point. And um, again, back to Mr. Donegan's question of what can the school committee do? You're on a committee, which is um, the Elementary School Restructuring Task Force. I have said for a long time, and sometimes I get tomatoes thrown at me for saying this, but I'll say it in public. We have excellent elementary school teachers and principals. They are, uh, to use a metaphor, fighting a really tough fight with one, at least one hand tied behind their back. The schedule's difficult for them. The school year is difficult. They're just some real structural, the size of the schools, the size of the classes. Um, as Mr. Minicello was saying, if you have those young kids, the burr babies, and there are a lot of challenges that, from a policy perspective, we can clean up to help them. And that, it's not easy. But I think, you know, as we, we look at examples, we invested, or you actually invested, at the Huntington School. They've, they've shown nice results. Not the greatest results in the world, but they've shown nice, steady results. They are known school. You know, they really put a focus on there, and that those scores have jumped at the unknown. So it's not that we don't have the ability to do it. It's that do we have the will to sort of do what we know needs to be done and what we have proven we can do at scale for all of our schools? And that's going to be the challenge. But you're absolutely right. We have very, you walk into the schools, we have great teachers. We probably have the best teachers in any urban system I've seen. Great principals, we have you know, good supports. It's, it's just a challenging situation that I think we can improve. Well, and I think sometimes we end up chasing our tail a little bit too because the needs are constantly evolving. Yes. Um, so you, you think you put your thumb on a weak spot and you, you, you invest some money and 
and you make some gains there, and then all of a sudden a new need emerges, or a different need emerges, or, or you know. So I think that's a that's a tough thing that we face too, and it's harder to address with the younger kids when you have less time before they take their first test. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. and so, I'd, what's that? Yeah, you know, I, it's it's a tough thing, and I just I would hate for anybody to leave here feeling like. Uh, you know, they got thrown under the bus, or for people to make simple kind of analysis of what you shared with us and say there's something wrong in our in our elementary schools, um, or or that's the one thing that we don't do as well as we should or could, um, because I, I I just I don't believe that to be true. Well, thank you for pointing that out, and let me say for the record. Um you saw some really nice improvement last year, especially at the in math, so um, at the elementary level. So thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, thank you for your time and effort in this. There's a dog in back for your follow-up. Just to summarize all of this, I think uh, on one, one end, uh, again, I'm going to say we really need to know, A, what our specific needs are and of course they are evolving and ever changing um, and what are the criteria that the state education folks use to determine things like SGP so that if we see that our needs um, don't match up or our strengths don't match up with some of the things that they want us to have as strengths um, that needs to be highlighted and to the extent that we can go to our legislative delegation as we did when we were able to help get the grants for, for those two schools last year, um, we'll do that. And then of course the other end of it too is there, you know, I, I suppose that there's some, um, I just kind of wrote in big letters to myself, the law of diminishing returns. We've had some pretty good um, results over the last three or four years in Brockton. Um, in spite of you know the disaster that happened in Haiti, which I think you were alluding to when you said 2009, were you not? Well, budget cuts. Yeah, uh, and then the budget cuts. Students, and, yep, so. Yep. so um, all of those things, you know, you can only. Well, you said it, I think, more eloquently, Ethan. Was just, you know, at some point your 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 improvements going to level off, and so that other. Dist other districts that we may be comparing ourselves to have have started at a much lower point, and and their gains are going to look a lot more impressive. Yeah, the questions. Thank you, thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Dr. Kinsel. Um, the next item. Okay. Yeah. Um, I put on here the uh, EPS policy manual. I think we'd like to put that off until we see our new school committee seated for uh, the new year. I don't think any of you are unhappy about that. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a project we would like to start to tackle at some point. <laughs> <laughs> But we would like to set up a subcommittee meeting for the finance subcommittee on our for the 22nd. Our Tuesday nights seem to, you know, by putting that extra Tuesday night aside, it gives us time to to dig deep into the things that we are discussing. If it's not before a school committee meeting, so the 22nd we'd like to have a finance subcommittee meeting, and on the 29th we'd like to have that follow-up curriculum meeting uh, with Liz Barry, our uh, Office of Learning and Teaching, to do some presentations to you. I'm sorry, Ms. Mrs. Mrs. Joy. Sure. Can, can, can we do seven o'clock starts? We did that with our curriculum subcommittee meeting. Is that all right? Not on the 22nd, just the 29th for me personally. Okay. Um, because I have the Davis. Um, and then we'll have a Mr. Donegan. A, a pretty significant conflict on the 22nd, and I really would like to be at that meeting. I don't know. And I, what, could you get there at a certain time? Or? No, I'm going to be from. That whole evening, I'm going to be out of commission. So, I Mr. Jerome. Twenty-nine. That's I, I'm fine with that. It's up to the, the committee. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking for the 29th for our uh, finance subcommittee meeting. 
why don't we s schedule that and then we'll plan for the next free Tuesday for the curriculum meeting. 7 p.m.? Okay. Okay, I'll... Preferences? I know that we prefer the Iron Homes Central, but if that's unavailable, then we can figure out where to go. Okay. Uh, any other items that school committee members would like, Mr. Carpenter? I think we also need to schedule the facilities too, and obviously we'll have to push it a couple weeks out, but I think a lot of the discussion over the last hour and a half here keeps coming back to classrooms and class sizes. And we had some experience with this last year on facilities and coming up with the plan that eventually led to the reopening of the B.B. Russell. Um, so I think there's some really important factors here. The first one is we did the B.B. Russell last year. We split the money into two fiscal years. If we do need to reopen another school building for next year, we're probably going to have to do the same thing. We can't wait till the end of the year. We, we have to figure out earlier on how much money to do what and where we're going to find it in the current budget. Might require taking some money out from someplace else. Um, so I think financing, we, we need to get planning. I think last year, those of us in the facilities committee we were really under the gun. We were pressured to come up with an answer. And um, we ended up all agreeing on this temporary solution at the B.B. Russell, but I don't think we want to keep doing temporary solutions with buildings. So um, I think we need a little more time to work. And I, I know, Superintendent, we're going to work on a master plan as a big plan, but I think in the interim we need to get figuring out some classrooms for next year. Um, we have Mr. Thomas looking into that as we see yeah, and, and then to visit buildings. And then my, my third point, if I could, is uh, because we were so rushed on the time last year, I mean, they were literally already tearing apart the B.B. Russell before we even figured out exactly what we're going to do with it. That's the kind of pressure we're under. Um, I think we need to have a chance for a little community input also. And I think we got to get that process because if we're going to be talking about adding a building, changing a building, whatever it may be, it impacts the community. We've got to give the community a chance to come in and tell us what they think about the, the plans that we're, we're making. So for all of those reasons, um, you know, I, I believe very firmly in high quality neighborhood schools for all kids in all neighborhoods and I'm, I don't like this system of busing kindergarten kids all across the city to a central location. I'm hearing from a lot of parents who don't like it either. Um, and the fact that we probably need to reestablish another neighborhood school, I, I think it's the Whitman School myself, maybe it's the Howard, I don't know. They all belong to the city right now, but we're, at some point we're going to have to ask for one back or we're not going to have any classrooms next year. So um, I, for all those reasons, I, I would ask the committee to go along with it. And this is the tricky part. We're going to start working on something, and we're going to have to hand the ball off to some other people coming on in January. But I don't think we can justify waiting till after the first of the year to at least begin doing the homework on it to get going. And then I'm sure the other folks coming on will catch on. I think Mr. Healy will have to hand off the baton because he'll be the only one remaining on facilities after the first of the year. So. Um, but for all those reasons, I, I think I'd like to schedule facilities, but in deference to the um, finance committee meeting, you know, maybe early November after we get through, maybe November 12th, something like that. Mr. I can work that out with well, the other yeah, two I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Caput, I interrupted yeah, that's you. That's okay. Your... No, I'm, I'm fine, Mayor. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Mr. Donegan. Um, uh, just to, uh, by way of suggestion, is it possible that we could schedule this, even though it primarily is a facility subcommittee, if we could do it even as a policy or finance so that we could get the input of the committee and... and I think all committee members are always invited to all the subcommittees. Mm -hmm. I attend subcommittees routinely that I'm not a member of, so I think the members that are interested are certainly invited. And realistically, Tony, at the end of the day, we're just going to make a recommendation, and, and then it's going to be vetted out by the mm -hmm. full committee before anything's finally decided. Okay. I'd love to have you at a facilities meeting, Tony. Yeah, I'd like to be there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I. Other than the, the scheduling of that, are there any other items that members want referred to subcommittee? I think that's probably a lot for the next couple of weeks. All right, seeing none, then we'll move on. Uh, so wait, there are no items under unfinished business. We um, already did the Chartwell's presentation. Are there any other items for new business? Mr. Donegan. Um, 
One or two, a couple of announcements and a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one was the, from people in, in the area have been asking me uh, the status of the, uh, the, we talked about this last year, the planetarium and greenhouse renovations. Um, should I just go one at a time or throw out all the Madam questions? Madam Superintendent, um, can I invite Mr. Thomas to come up, please? We just, as far as the planetarium goes, uh, we just recently signed uh, a letter. Uh, we got um, $5,000 from the 3M Corporation uh, to Brockton High School Science Department to enhance the ability for students uh, to use our um, you know, planetarium. Um, and it, we talk here about uh, if they award Brockton High School, if the 3M Corp awards Brockton High School with $100,000 needed to place the computer and projection equipment in the dome theater, then we will commit to renovating the high school's dome theater, including painting the dome, replacing the furniture and carpet, estimated at another $120,000. So we're looking to do a match uh, with the planetarium. Yes, the work, the facility work that needs to be done in the planetarium could be done in house. Oh. So if we can get the money to replace, the big part is the computer and the, the actual system that that um, mm -hmm. shows the stars right, and right. the moon and everything. Um, then you know that's the big piece. But the the actually um, the in-house piece would not be that big of a project because it's actually in pretty good shape um, as far as structurally. It's in really good shape. It would be changing out the chairs, um, which there's not a lot of chairs um, and some paint and um, cosmetic work. But the big thing is to get the grant that would replace the actual system right. that runs it. Because we all know Pluto isn't a planet anymore. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, well, well, I have you here, Mr. Thomas. Uh, I was also asked about handicap access to, to the stadium, and I, I know I had a conversation with you about this. So if you, if you could just very briefly just... Yeah, as the redesign of the, um, the Marciano statue, we're hoping now that when um, handicapped drivers could pull in through Forest Ave during games or come in to see the statue, because the hill that sits beside the visitor um, and me and um, the, the Marciano committee worked on this. Mr. Carpenter was a member of the facility subcommittee as well. That um, we would cut into that hill, make that the handicapped parking area, also with some spots for people, visitors coming to visit the Marciano statue. But also, um, um, we we're also looking into building, uh, um, removing probably the first three or four rows in section of the home side and building a ramp that comes up. Um, so people uh, in wheelchairs or, or that have trouble walking can get into the stands. That's something that, again, that's um, because the stadium is as old as, as it is, we're not out of code. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, you know, the thing for us, the right thing for us to do, and again, it's always been supported by mm -hmm. the school committee, is to, to try to make our facilities more handicap accessible. And again, even though, you know, you're not forced to do it because we, again, we're grandfathered, it's, it's, it's doesn't mean you shouldn't do it and right. I think it's something that we need to do and it's been po talked about as um, as part of the redesign of Marciano Stadium and uh, yeah it was my understanding that that's something that you guys had already planned to do but we, we, this year was kind of a loss in that in that respect because I know that some of the people took exception to the when those changes happened that they couldn't drive their cars into the stadium as they had in the past and so I wanted to you know assure those folks that it's not something that hasn't been yeah the plan is to, to just, have them yeah things are going in accordance with the plan exactly the, the answer to your greenhouse, greenhouse. question oh no that's right we didn't get no, to the greenhouse no mr thomas greenhouse anybody greenhouse um we spent we we sp I spent about um, not me but the facilities department spent about six thousand last summer to redo the actual greenhouse itself. We did we did the apron over the concrete apron. We added a um, platform form on that apron for for plants. Um, we replaced about ten windows that were damaged inside you know on the greenhouse itself. And then the summer of working learning program uh, with Laurie Silver and Ross Ferguson. Um, spent some time and some money on um, redoing the outside yep. um, so again I haven't seen it since early September but uh, as it was in the summer it was in really good shape 
<laughs> so, um, you know, we also added some from fencing there, and we were able to buy a lot of um, guarding, guarding and equipment for, um, you know, for the um, for the facility as well. Okay. Um, next question was, I, I suppose, um, for Mr. Jerome or, or yourself. Um, well, let me, let me get back to that. The, the, uh, the one, one announcement that I wanted to make, this is for the folks in Ward 3. Um, this is something that I've been harping on for probably a year now um, in response to people in, in the Ash Street and Market Street area. I wanted to let people know that um, that Tom, Tom Brophy, uh, Councilman Tom Brophy is going to sponsor myself and and Ta Mr. Thomas, we're going before the Traffic Commission on the 31st, and I wanted to let people in, in Ward 3 know that the, the two big things that we're asking about, among others, are first, uh, we've, we've looked into, and, and Mr. Thomas was able to get grant money to pay for raised crosswalks uh, over at the, on, on Ash Street near the Kennedy School, and also down on Market Street at the intersection uh, at the parking lot of the Huntington School in the uh, Keith Ave extension. Um, the, the safety enhancement, of course, is it raises the little one's heads a little bit higher, and statistically they stand a much greater chance if, if they were to unfortunately get hit by a car. Uh, that statistically they, they run a much higher, lower chance of incurring some kind of a traumatic brain injury. So it's an important safety issue, and so it's, it's really something that I know a lot of people in Ward 3 have wanted to see. And then the other issue, too, is something that has been talked about for a long time, would be a um, extension of the curbing at the intersection of Ash Street and Hillburg Avenue to uh, make it a 90 degree angle to stop folks from treating it as though it's a highway exit and, you know, flying onto Ash Street from Hillburg Avenue at a high rate of speed or, or off of Ash Street onto Hillburg at a high rate of speed. It kind of forces them to to come to the full stop that the stop sign indicates they ought to be doing. Um, and then the other issue for uh, Mr. Jerome, I, I think I can probably just do that. I'm taking enough time, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Donnegan, again, that traffic commission meeting is? Oh, that's October 31st, yes. Okay, just in case residents want to be there. That's that's what I'm urging anybody who's who has a, uh, a uh, uh, feels they have a horse in that race in Ward 3, please come, please vo voice your concerns because I think it will be very persuasive to the Traffic Commission. Any other items for new business? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion adjourned. Second. Second, all in favor? Opposed, so move. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you all.